four goals. Uh, one, improving the affordability of course materials for students in higher ed. Uh, but two, also improving the outcomes of students that are using our platform specifically. Uh, so we do that by uh, partnering with all higher ed textbook publishers. We take their content, put it onto our platform, uh, which is a platform that's built from the ground up for studying textbooks and course materials. So it has uh, features like flashcards, note taking, automatic citations, study guides, uh, professor student collaboration. Uh, and then we work with universities uh, to deliver that content to students. Uh, we do that in mass. So, what we do is we transition publishers from their traditional model of uh, selling a paper textbook for you know, $150, but only selling that book to maybe 5 10% of the total market. Uh, the rest of the students either buying it from a used bookseller, pirating it, or just going without it. Uh, and we move into a model of, uh, of a digital rental. So having that as a $15, $20 rental for the semester. Uh, or uh, what's very more common is universities are starting to just include that as part of uh, tuition for uh, any student on campus. They get all the materials uh, up front for how to charge them. Uh, we've been really, really successful at this. We work with 600 universities, uh, ranging from small liberal arts uh, schools to large institutions. UCLA, Oregon State, uh, Cornell, um, and then uh, we also have uh, had about 400,000 students on our platform so far. So, uh, you know, this thing that sounds interesting to you, uh, you want to learn more about it, please talk to uh, one of the other Red Shelfers here, which, uh, Red Shelfers, please raise your hands. Uh, yep, so I forced them to come here specifically to answer your questions, so please, uh, please go up to them. Uh, with that, we'll move back to
and uh, we'll just go back and forth like you normally would. And to start us off, we'll go with the note side first. Cool. So, basically, uh, we're going to do a very, very. So, how many of you guys have heard of serverless computing before? Okay, so most. So, we'll do a very quick history lesson then to gloss over what serverless is, and then we're going to do the fun part. So, back in the day, uh, like 20 years ago, so not, not that far back in the day, but we used to own the servers, right? We would buy our own, uh, we would buy our own servers, we would set them up ourselves, we would do all the DevOps for them, install all of the software, and then, you know, set up all of the networking, and this required a lot of specialized knowledge, it required a lot of, uh, a lot of expertise that many developers just didn't have because they wanted to write code and not manage servers. So this was kind of cost prohibitive for companies, for people wanting to start companies and you know, start writing code. If you had to manage your own server, it was kind of a pain in the ass and uh, didn't make coding nearly as fun. So then we started moving everything to the cloud. We, you know, these big companies like Amazon, Google, Microsoft, they realized that, hey, there's a lot of developers out there and owning your own servers is expensive, it costs a lot of money, it costs a lot of resources to maintain. We have a lot of resources, we have a lot of servers, we have all this extra power, so let's enable it and let's basically resell our computing resources to developers, to small SaaS companies, so that they could easy, you know, easily um, start deploying their applications and start being more productive. So we started moving everything to the cloud, and now you have AWS, Google Cloud, you know, you know, Microsoft Azure, all of these providers that, that are super easy to use, and you can write any application, whether it's Node or Go or PHP, and just throw it up on the server and have them manage it for you. And then, just a couple of years ago, companies also realized that, hey, now we have all of these companies that are deploying their applications, their infrastructures to our clouds, and we have all of this data, all of these analytics on what languages they're using, what features of those languages they're using, so they thought, hey, we can make more money if we simplify DevOps, right? So that's how Platform as a Service was born, and a good example of that is uh, Amazon's Elastic Beanstalk service or Google's um, App Engine, where they give you a simple app, they give you a simple container, they give you a simple uh, server, basically, that's pre-configured, so you don't have to do any more management. You basically just ship them your code and tell them, hey, this is a PHP application, I want it to run latest version of PHP, and they do all of the DevOps for you. So that's kind of the how we got to the DevOps uh, movement, or platform as a service. And then finally, while we as developers, we were going through all of these transformations, moving our code from our servers to the cloud, and then having the cloud providers manage it for us, uh, this really gave birth to software as a service, where, where developers and organizations realized, hey, we, you know, we have all of this computing power, and it's very cost effective and it's very low cost to basically create a solution and offer it as, as a service. So while we were building our own applications, hundreds of thousands of other developers started writing software as a service. So Azure, for example, we do identity as a service. Twilio does messaging as a service. Um, SendGrid does email as a service. So all of these companies started doing one thing and one thing really well, where you could just integrate into their API and have all this functionality very easily, and again, it lowered the costs significantly because you as a developer, you no longer have to build your own uh, you know, SMTP server or your own messaging service. You could just integrate with the third-party API into your application, and it all just worked really great. And uh, so finally, we get to server as a service, or you know, other names for it are serverless, microservices, cloud functions, functions as a service, and much, much more. And, you know, serverless isn't really a, an accurate description, I would say, because it's not, you know, when you go to define serverless, it really is just someone else's servers. So there's still a server, you're still writing code, you're still deploying it somewhere, but the, the paradigm shift with serverless computing is that you no longer are building large monolithic applications, you're no longer writing a whole PHP application and pushing it to the cloud. You're just writing little little bits and pieces of functionality to send an email, for example, or to you know, create a user account, 
to sign up and use it for a newsletter, or you're just writing little bits and pieces of functionality for your applications and basically extending them. So a really good definition of serverless uh, by this guy, Rob, is um, auto scale and no idle costs. And this is, a, this is really the, the most powerful definition of serverless that I think exists. Because if you go to AWS and you purchase a server, or you, you know, get a server and you deploy your application, whether your application is being used or not, you're being charged for those resources. So whether you do a micro instance or a large instance, you're still getting charged whether you have one person on there or 50 or 1,000. With serverless, you only get charged, and this is true of all of the serverless providers up to now, uh, you only get charged for the resources you use. So when users come to your application, they sign up for the newsletter, that serverless function gets called, gets activated, you get charged for that one call. And uh, if nobody's signing up for your newsletter, you have the functionality, but you're not getting charged for it. So there's no idle costs. And uh, if you look at a couple of, uh, couple of examples of serverless functions and serverless providers, uh, we have Webcast, which we're gonna use today, uh, Google Cloud Functions, AWS Lambda, which is probably the most well-known, the most uh, kind of the, the complement um, serverless solution. Uh, SaaS applications, I would say, are serverless applications because, again, you're just calling an API endpoint, and it just that that single API endpoint just does one thing and one thing really well. And uh, I think that's enough about what serverless is. Let's uh, let's learn a bit more about. Me. So, when we did one of these talks um, before, like a year ago, the question was, was how many of you have used ES6? And pretty much no hands went up. So we tailored the talk for that. And then we figured, you know what, it's 2018. Let's ES6 everything. And then I saw the same amount of hands go up today. So ES6. Who's used it? Who like knows? Uh, has integrated it mostly into their daily workflow? All right, I feel better. Cool. So what is what is Vue.js? Vue.js is a uh, progressive JavaScript framework, and what that really means is progressive. Just means it can go up and down the spectrum of what JavaScript frameworks do for us these days. And that's why you see the competition between React and Vue and Angular um, is because a lot of people pick the different tool that is right for the job, right? And it all depends. Like, I have all three running in production for random things. But what I like to do as a comparison is on the left side of this chart, you're going to have frameworks, libraries that do less for you, which is like React, which is very much concerned with the Vue instance, which is the view layer. Uh, in the middle you have view, which makes it progressive because you can go up and down the spectrum. Uh, React can actually go up and down as well. And Angular is Angular 2 plus, V2 plus, Angular 6 now, um, is seen more as a, a framework, right? It does so many things for you. Uh, it really helps large teams work together. And so all three of those have their own spectrum of what you can do. So if if anyone you know gets into a flame war with you, just tell them it depends. It's the answer to everything you know. But it does depend. So when should you use Vue? My speaker notes disappeared. Um, when would I use Vue? Is I would probably start using Vue uh, for anything that is, I guess, front end light. So not anything that requires like Angular. Angular, I would use if I was working on like a large team. Uh, TypeScript really helps with uh, managing that large of a, a project. Vue and React are really good with starting out small and then growing as you grow your application. Right? So we are going to demo, and that link is broken. Don't go there. But the right link is going to be gif battle, gif dash battle dot netlify dot com. Okay. 
So what we're going to build is a, a GIF babbling site where we're going to have three components. One, we're going to create a GIF with a caption, like uh, happy birthday. CSA. Um, but we'll have create a caption. You can create it. Down here, we're going to have um, five of these are from uh, we, we input data, or we'll delete those. And then you can vote, and then you'll have a leaderboard, which is the third part. Uh, and this guy cannot be beat. So we're going to build these three parts uh, in Circles, Node, and View, and hopefully we all learn something out of this. Cool? Yeah? Any special requests on? Yeah, you just didn't say when do you use View? Yeah. Um, I, I would use View for any time you want to prototype something like this in an API. Um, Time. I would, because I, I like the uh, approach of like use it until it gets so ugly that you have to find a bigger tool. Because most of the stuff I built wasn't really making to. Yeah. Why would you use view over react? Very good question. Um, <laughs> I have no allegiances to anybody, so except uh, Google. I'm a, I'm a Google developer expert. <laughs> I would use React more currently. Um, and the big thing with Vue is, if you haven't used Angular 1, is the templating. So ES6 right now, web components right now, are three things. Uh, and the, this is the way the web is moving, is a template, a JavaScript uh, component to it, so like a class, and CSS, or just styles. Right? So three, three parts to a component. And if you look at Vue, React, and Angular, they're all doing the same thing. They're doing components, right? So back to your question. Vue is more for people that are comfortable with HTML and like it. And it's, it's familiar, right? You've been using HTML. You go into Vue, and then you'll see in a second how Vue takes an HTML template and kind of sprinkles some magic on top with JavaScript. And I think the biggest turnoff for React is JSX. Because if anyone looks at JSX and like looks at the React docs, they immediately go, no, absolutely not. I don't know. Which was my reaction, too. But after using it, and um, I just rebuilt my entire site. The new Scotch is going to be uh, Reactified. But I, I'm a big fan of, if you use JSX, I think you will become a better JavaScript developer. Uh, you just learn JavaScript better. And, uh, Turner's things, your mapping. Just so, right now, my answer to that is maybe don't. <laughs> but uh, build something in both, see what you like. It also depends on what your teammates like, how your how your workplace works. It all depends. That's my cheating answer. Um, so, yeah, let's just build this thing. Uh, can you guys hear us without the mic? Because it's going to be hard to type and speak. So, can you just put the mic down and we'll yell? Yeah. That works. <coughs> and um, to also add, add to Chris's uh, why you would use Vue.js, uh, it just really comes down to familiarity. So if you are a web developer and you've been working with jQuery for a while and you've been working with Angular 1.x, uh, moving to Angular 2 Plus or you know, the new Angular or moving to React is a bit of a paradigm shift that requires you to you know, understand Webpack, understand build systems, understand JSX. So you as a, if you're more of a junior developer, Vue.js is going to have a much lower barrier to entry and be you know, much more easy on you. Uh, but definitely, you know, like Chris said, use the right tool for the job. React is great. Angular is great. Vue is great for prototyping. Like I, I haven't used Vue really in uh, in too many production apps, just because Vue is still kind of the new kid on the block. It is getting a lot of uh, popularity. It is getting a lot of uh, a lot of fans. It has like the most GitHub stars right now out of all of the, the front end frameworks. But again, use the right tool for the job. And Vue is great for prototyping. It's great for building something quick and dirty. But it you know recently you can build big applications. So that's not to say that you can't build big applications with Vue. It's just it's going to be easier with React and Angular. So again, it really depends. 
But let's get into um, let's get into our application. So Chris kind of demoed it, and uh, let's talk about how we're going to build it. So we're going to use a platform called Webcast.io, which is going to um, which is going to allow us to build and deploy a fully functioning Node API. So we're just going to be writing JavaScript code. We're going to write a very simple Express application. And as soon as we're done writing the code, we're going to hit save, and our code's going to be deployed to a browser somewhere, to, to a remote URL somewhere. And um, so this is Webcast. And I have the editor pulled up right here. And um, so. So uh, for those of you guys that have worked with uh, Express before, this should look fairly uh, familiar. We're uh, pulling in the Express library, body parser, request, uh, JSON web tokens, which we'll use later. So at the beginning of our, of our application, we're just pulling in a bunch of imports that we're going to be working with. On line 9, we say, uh, you know, instantiate the Express application. Now we won't need it. And uh, the first part of our application is going to be the, that first creating, uh, getting a random GIF from an API, and then also uh, getting a random GIF, and then also being able to save a GIF and a caption. So I have two endpoints here. Uh, one is an app.get uh, random, which is going to allow us to get a random GIF from the GIFI API, and we haven't implemented that yet, so we'll do that in real time. And then the post endpoint, which is going to allow us to send some data to our API to save that. So I have the uh, Giphy uh, link commented here, but let's just see how we're going to do that. It's going to be fairly simple. We're just going to make a request to this endpoint. And the reason that we're calling the Giphy API from our API is because the Giphy API requires us to have a private API key, right? And we couldn't put this in the browser, otherwise anybody could steal our API key and uh, use our resources, but uh, we wouldn't want that. So all of this code that we write is going to be protected within our web task, so no developer is going to be able to read the code. So once we do that, we're going to get an error. And uh, Chris is a huge fan of ES6 and using arrow functions and using all of this crazy stuff, crazy new stuff, but I'm more old school, but I'll try to kill it to get it done. You have this argument every time you do it. One's just easier. Just wants to use bars everywhere. So basically, we're going to make the request to the Giphy API. It's going to, once it successfully makes the request, it's going to send back a whole bunch of JSON data back. And uh, so here on line 28, we're going to get the body. We're going to parse that JSON so we can work with it. And then we're going to create our GIF. So, so the data we're going to get back from GIF is going to have like 200 properties. And we really only care about two of them. We care that we get the URL of the GIF and also the unique identifier of the GIF, so it's ID. All the other data we can just throw away. So that's what we're going to do here. Uh, we're going to say, give us the ID of the GIF, and that's going to live in body.data.id, and then the URL, which is going to live in And once we have that, we're just going to send it back to our application response. Format and send back that. So I'm going to hit save. And this URL at the bottom here, I don't know if you guys can see it, is our actual application running live on Webcast. So if I copy it here, go into my browser, and hit the random endpoint, I should get a response back. So now we have the random endpoint. So if we go and hit the random endpoint, refresh the page, we're going to get an ID and then a GIF. And if we hover over it, we'll see what the GIF is. And uh, just as a uh, fair disclaimer, the GIFI API uh, returns random GIFs, and we have no control over what the GIFs coming back are. So <laughs> sometimes we, you'll get some really random and maybe inappropriate stuff. If that does come up, we have a and the refresh function is going to give us a new GIF, but fair disclaimer. 
So anytime we refresh, we're going to get a new random gift back. And it looks good. So now let's go ahead and implement our functionality for saving a caption, right? So now we have a GIF, we can display it in our application once we build it, but we want to be able to add a caption, hit save, and then save it in our database. And the way we're going to do that is, first we're going to get the GIF information from our um, request that comes in. And so we're going to read the body. And then I have this, um, so for our database, uh, we were debating, like, do we put all of these GIFs, do we store them in Mongo, do we put them in Firebase, do we store them in memory, uh, you know, what the, what the right level of abstraction is. And WebTask actually allows you to store up to 500 kilobytes of data within each function that you write. So we decided it would be easiest to go that route without having to configure another database and kind of have another level of, uh, of complexity. So we're just going to use WebTask's built-in um, built storage. And I have a handy function here that, uh, that's going to get us the, the storage information here. So basically, we just call the, the request method, webtask context, and go into the storage property. So it's really just a JSON memory store. And the way that that works is we're going to say database passing our request. And then we're going to get some data back. And that data. If we don't have any data, in the, so if we do have data existing in the database, we're, we'll set a data attribute to that. If we don't, we'll set it to an empty array because this is just going to be an array of GIFs that we have saved with the captions. So that's that. And then we're just going to push our new GIF onto it. So we can get it on push, pass in our GIF, and then we're going to save the new data element, the new array, in, back into the web task storage. And that's going to look like I'm going to set the data, pass in the data attribute, and we we'll get an error back, but we'll just ignore it for now. And we're going to send a message saying that this was successful. So Chris is going to have to trust me that this works because I'm not going to, I can't test it in the browser directly because this is a post request, but let's make sure our app still works and we can get a random GIF. We can. So now I will uh, turn it over to Chris to implement the first part, these two endpoints that we've just written with Node.js into our view application. Cool. Um, it's funny because we, we do this and it's like, oh, we just deploy like a Node API to be live and be able to hit endpoints, but that was a pain before uh, certain little stuff. Pointing node to DigitalOcean is still not fun. Maybe I'm just lazy. Okay, so we have these two API endpoints. Um, let's use them. So when I said that view, I said that Vue was a progressive um, framework. What I meant by that is it can do a couple different things, right? So if we had an HTML application, um, I'm going to go to HTML. So if we had an HTML app, uh, one thing you could do is just include the uh, Vue script tag here. Can everyone see this okay? Is that okay? Um, so if we implement the view script tag here, you could just uh, add a script tag here and create a new view instance and say uh, view.component and then hello is your component name and then you would just have uh, like data in it, message. And then you could use this directly in your application um, here, and you just like hello. So that's what I mean by it can go to the far left of the spectrum, where it's more just the view library, um, and you can kind of just use the script tag and just start using view, which is really cool. 
Um, we're going to go towards the middle of the spectrum a little bit more, closer to the uh, single page app, like a little bit more control on the view side. And to do that, um, we would have to uh, start using ES6 imports like So let's say we had two different components. We would say imports hello from the hello file. And to start doing ES6 uh, imports, since our browsers, as much as we love them, are still catching up to a lot of the ES6 features, uh, we would need to bring in Webpack, right? So how many of us have used Webpack, uh, built our own systems? OK, cool. Awesome. So the way we're going to do it today is we're going to use the Vue CLI which does a lot of that Webpack stuff for us. We don't really want to. So what I have here is a starter kit uh, on the left that we can kind of see. So this is the start of a, a Vue CLI application. You have your public folder. And let's take a look at package.json. So the recommended way to start a view application with the CLI is your dependencies will be basically just that, right? So you bring in view through your package.json, and then we can start using it. Uh, um, and app.view will be our entry for this. Let me see if I can. OK. And the way that um, these dot view single page, single file components are made is view is going to have a script, a template, and a style. And you can see that dot view extension. So this is what view considers a component. And this is the main app component that will house all of our children. So let's start with the template. We're going to have a header component, which I made earlier. You guys don't want to see us make nav bars. Um, hero component, which is like that big section of color. Uh, and then we're going to have the create set com component, the battle component, and the leaderboard component in all three. And if you wanted to look at the header real quick, so here's the header. We have the login button, but we don't need it right now. So the header will just have a template, which is just a basic nav bar. And if you're wondering about styles, we're using Bulma, um, which is like a bootstrap alternative. And that's, that's what those crazy classes are. Uh, this is the scripts. Honestly, we don't need any of this. So the name is the header, and the styles um, are there. And what's cool about Vue kind of weird in React as far as component-based styling, is we can add a style here that is, let's say we have a dot .navbar class here. So we can say dot .navbar background um, bad ass, right? So we can do that navbar, but that would apply to all navbars across our entire application. What Vue does that's really cool is you can do scoped. So these styles will only apply to this template above. Doesn't. <laughs> um, you know what? I'm not entirely sure, but if I had to guess, you could probably bring SAS into the Vue CLI and have it process that way. Um, but I have no idea. It would be. Uh, it would be just like with that Angular. If you were, if you had the SAS uh, bundling system built in, it would uh, look for the file and compile the, the SAS engine. I was going to say good question, but good question really means I don't, I didn't know the answer. <laughs> so, uh, so this is our header. Any questions about how a view component is is um, put together? Template, script, style. If you wanted, you could like move one above the other. You you can tell. Um, so let's go back into our app view. This is where everything exists. Um, 
And to use these components, header, hero, create, battle, leaderboard, we had to import them. So I have them here imported from components header, components hero, components create, components all the way down. And then we just have some basic styles that you imported because nobody wants to like, watch me write CSS. And this is our view component. We just declare these components. And after you declare them, you can use them. Okay? Um, in the template. So let's get to the create component. This is where we actually get to write some code. And if you're wondering about folder structure, we have source, which is where you put everything that you're working on. The components. Sorry, that's weird. OK, so components. It's going to create, we already had it open. Um, and then to start this application, we're going to go into our uh, terminal. And you can do this a couple different ways. If you look at package.json, you're going to have under scripts, where'd you go? You're going to have serve, which is part of the view CLI, but serve will start the application. Build will compile it and make it ready for production. And Lint will just tell you where you messed up. So we're going to use serve. And if we close this out, we're going to go here, npm run serve. Or you can do yarn serve. And I believe the Vue CLI has its own command for it. So now we have our application, local 8080. We can open that up. And that's uh, what we had. We had the header, hero create, hero section for the other thing, and then hero section for the leaderboard. So let's do create. Okay. So. First thing we need to do is get data from Auto's API, right? And here, under our view application, uh, what we have is there's a couple different parts to a view component. So you'll have data. Uh, methods, which is an object, and yeah. So in data, we will return an object of all the data this component will be using. So let's say message is I am the message. Cool. And then to use that, we can just go into our template and use uh, what's called interpolation, double, double brackets, and just say message. So that's the basics of view uh, data and templating for the data. So we have our message here. Let's zoom in a little bit. OK. Now, this is what's really cool about all of the newer JavaScript sort of frameworks, is if we did this in jQuery or just vanilla JavaScript, you would have to create your data, and then you would have to insert that data into the template. So we're basically saying, let's get rid of that whole document .get element by I query, class name, whatever it is anymore, uh, and then like inner HTML. Let's get rid of all that boilerplate and just say map one to the other at all times, right? So it cleans up our code immensely compared to what we used to do. And that's, that's kind of the benefit of, of these new uh, libraries. So we have a message here. This isn't very helpful. We actually need to get data from this guy's API. So we're going to go ahead and create a function called uh, get random gif, which is a function. And then we're going to return. And who's, who's used Axios before for making API calls? Axios, Axios, Axios. Axios from Axios. OK. So Axios is a great HTTP library to make API calls. We're going to go. We're not even returning anything. I'm going to write this the promise way, and then I'm going to write it the async await way. Um, cool. 
So we're going to go with Axios.get, and um, I could go copy Auto's full URL, but I put it in uh, an environment variable. If you open up the .env, it's right here, view app. Okay. Okay. So um, I'm going to pull it from our environment file. Uh, we're going to use ES6 template backticks process.env.view underscore app underscore API slash random. Change it because the API URL is too long. Okay, so autos um, URL changed. Alright, so that's the API that auto just created for us. Um, So axios.get random, and then we're going to do a dot then response, um, and then we're going to let's just console log response to see what's up. But I think that should just give us the diff directly, or response that data should give us. So let's open up inspect element console. I do this all the time. So uh, nothing happened. Nothing got console logged. Because we never called the, the method. We just created it, never called it. I've spent hours on it. So, um, the cool thing that Vue has another feature you have data where you define your data, you have methods where you define your main functions, and then you also have what are called lifecycle hooks. So, like, let's say when this component gets added to our DOM, we want it to go get that random GIF. So what we do is we add it to this main object, created is a function, and then we say this dots, and this will reference a view component. So we say this dot get random view. So now that will call, and then we should get a response, console log, yes it is. Let's go back and console log response dot data. Cool, ID URL. And if we look at that here, cool. Um, so now we need to get that GIF into our application, into our template. So there's two steps to this. We have to add it to GIF, is null to start. And then once we have it, we just say this.gif is equal to data, response.data. Uh, and then up here, let's just really quickly do it. We'll have a div, uh, and this will only show the if, and we'll talk about this in a second. Sorry, it's not my computer. So v if gif, and we're going to say image, and we're going to v bind the source to gif dot url. So let's see if that worked, and then we'll talk about that. Uh, okay, we'll refresh. <laughs> Much better. Okay. Much better. So this is this goes back to the question of would you use React or Vue? Um, what Vue does is they take what is HTML, and then they kind of sprinkle stuff on top with what's called directives. It's V if and vbind is how we know that we're going to tell you, hey, look at exactly at this div, grab it, do something with it, put it back. Um, so the, the thing that a lot of uh, people in React say is like, why do I need to throw it into the DOM, grab it, manipulate it more, and then throw it back in, right? So it's like an extra step in there. Um, why not just like make my template in JavaScript and then inject it once? Uh, so that's something to consider when you're uh, choosing between the two. Uh, 
Uh, no, it, it renders specifically. So even in a list, it'll only render when it needs to. Uh, and the interesting thing is of all the benchmarks, they say view is still the fastest, which is kind of weird, yeah. So, uh, the if, the bind, that's how we get it into the templates. Uh, we have this, let's quickly change this to async await, just because I'm trying to annoy everybody with ES6. So that's one line ES6, still not as cool as async await, so we'll set async await const response is equal to, we'll delete that, and then we'll say this.gif is equal to response.data.gif, or no, response.data. And then if you wanted to be more annoying and go more ES6, you could destructure the data out of response. Like that. Um, so that's that. We have our GIF now. Let's quickly start building out the, what did that look like? GIF-battle. Nullify. Nice. Okay, so we have to build an input and a button and this thing. So, really quickly, I already have a class for it. We're going to go give container inside of that an image and then next to that, I think, dot caption. I should just cheat and look. Um, and then also, So this is a class of box, which gives it that white outside background. Vbind source, and then a cool thing that view can do if you're tired of writing all these vbinds, you can, uh, vbind can be shorthanded to colon. So that's it. So we have gif.url, and then caption here will show the caption, which we're about to do. And to do that, we need to write that here. Caption is blank to start. And just to make sure it works, like I am a caption. So if we go back, that's not ours. That's ours. I am a caption, image, box. Cool. Cool. All right. Uh, input. Input field. Image thing on my jig. Input type is text, which should be default. Dot input. Um, dot is large. Yeah. I'm going to separate this out because we need a couple more things. Placeholder is caption me. So now we're going to get into something else that's really cool with Vue, is uh, two-way data binding. Two-way data binding. So what is going to happen is if we start typing into this, it should update the caption itself, right? And to do that, we just have to simply take our input field and say vmodel is equal to caption. Cool. I am a caption. If we delete that, caption, caption, caption. Honestly, that's fun every single time you do it. Uh, Two-way data binding. Okay. And then we finally need a button that is uh, to submit. So button, I did A, huh? A dot button dot is info dot is outline. These are Bulma classes. What's that favorite one called? Button? What's that? What's that favorite? Bulma. Bulma. Yeah, B U L N A dot I O. Creates the GIF. So this button needs to actually make the post request to Auto's API. Is everybody good so far? Cool. Uh, 
Uh, this needs to make a post request. We need to make the method first. So down here, methods, get random gif. We're going to async have a create gif with caption. Um, and then we're going to say await axios.post. Don't like writing that out. Slash, that's it. All right. So we're going to make the template string. And then we can pass in the data, which is going to be the ID, which is the this.gift.id URL, this.gift.url, and caption is this.caption. So after we send all this data back to Auto's API, and like we could probably do a try catch to make sure there's no errors, but we're good developers and we never write errors. So um, after this is all said and done and we create a GIF, we're just going to do this dot get random GIF and get a new one. And this is where you would do like success notifications and stuff, but I think I'm moving really slow. So, oh, and we have to reset caption is equal to blank. So let's make sure this works. Inspect network XHR just in case. Um, refresh. Refresh. Uh, anybody want to throw the caption? Um, fine, I'll do one. Um, there's a new JS framework. <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> So if we create the GIF and we look at our network tab, sorry, it's getting cramped. Create. Always do it. I always make the method, I never hook it up, yeah. So to do that in view, we have vbind for properties. We have von for events. So the on and the bind are two of the fundamental parts of view. And that's the, the bind is getting data from the class into the template, and the on is going from the template to the class. So that's kind of the two-way connection you get. And the shorthand, thank you, is the uh, is at at click. So colon source or colon title, whatever you want to do, you can colon it. And then at click, you're just looking at the main HTML DOM events. Click um, mouse over, blur, that kind of stuff. And if you're wondering and disgusted, uh, that is actually completely valid HTML. Um, and if you want to look at the Angular 2 stuff too, that is completely valid HTML as well. That's Angular 2 or Angular 6. But we are. I feel bad because that was a good caption. Um, wall patrol, and then we'll go network tab, create the GIF, get sent out, post request 200 OK, message success, and then we got a new one. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, I think I'm done. That's, I think that's it for create. Cool. All right. <clears throat> so that was a uh, thorough and really good introduction to Vue.js, all of the different components of Vue. And uh, yeah, I mean, you guys are kind of new to Vue, so it was, we decided to spend a little more time on that. Uh, now let's get back to our application and. <laughs> But so we have the beta GIF feature complete. It works. The next one that we're going to implement is this fight or a battle section. And what we're going to do with this battle section is we're going to pick two random GIFs from our data store and uh, put them against each other. And then you, as the user, can vote on which one you like more. And whichever one gets you know voted on, 
its score is going to be in, you know, incremented by one. And we're actually using, I think, the same exact database for both the diff battle and the, uh, the actual application of local hosts. So that should be fun. <coughs> but uh, if you guys do go to uh, gifbattle.netlify.com, feel free to add any captions to any gifs, and we'll actually see them live in a second. So that's uh, it's always fun. But the next part of our backend API, of our serverless application that we're going to implement, is the ability to display the two random gifs and also the ability to create another post request to vote, to vote on which one you like better. And uh, just a brief, before I do that, a brief aside on serverless functions. So here with WebTask, I'm actually building an entire Express application with all of these various endpoints in one file. Uh, typically, you, you probably wouldn't want to do this because now you're building a monolithic application inside of a serverless function, which is kind of nasty. So. Ideally, what you would do is each of these endpoints would be its own file, its own serverless function, so that you can make changes to each endpoint independent of each other. So you can make changes, you can make edits, you can upgrade or deprecate the API without affecting any of the other serverless functions. But here, just for uh, just for brevity, we're going to keep all the endpoints in one in one location. So with that said, let's go ahead and implement the versus function. Going to give us two random gifts. So the endpoint is a get endpoint, and versus is the, the endpoint link. And the way that that looks is we're going to create a response object that's going to hold the two gifts. And then we're going to go to our database again that's going to give us a list of all the gifts in the database. Get it. And then in the callback function, we are just going to shuffle that data. So we're bringing in the uh, loadout shuffle thing, uh, method, which is basically just going to take our array, count it, and then return two gifts, the, two, the first two gifts in a random order. So basically, all we're doing is saying response gift underscore one is going to be our data object at, at the first index, and our second gift is going to be our data object at, a, at the second place in the index. Pretty simple, and then finally we're just going to send that data back as a response to our application. So I'll save it, copy, and let's just make sure that this endpoint works. So we'll go to versus. Uh oh, so invalid shorthand copy. Instead of uh, colons. So now every time we refresh, we're going to get two different GIFs back that are already created, that already have a caption, a URL, and all of that good stuff. So now let's go ahead and implement our endpoint to, to vote on which one you like more. So this one's going to be a post, and the way that we're going to do this one is uh, we're going to say let give equal to request body. So we're going to be, Chris is going to be sending us some data from the view application that's going to have the only the GIF identifier, I believe. So we're going to say let the GIF come from the request body, and then we're going to get our database again. In the callback function, once we have our data, we are going to find the index of where that GIF lives. So where in our data store is this GIF? And the way we're going to find it is we're going to say data, find the index, and give us the index of the item based on just its ID. And that ID, of course, comes from the GIF ID that that is going to send us. And then once we have the index, we're just going to go into it and increment the vote count by one. And we can also, we'll also have to save that, of course. So actually, I'll just copy this piece of code here. Basically, go back into our database, uh, save the new list of gifts with the uh, one that was upvoted by one count, and then send a successful message. And again, this one, since it is a post request, I'm not going to be able to test it in the browser, and um, I'm just going to throw it on Chris and uh, 
let him have the understanding. I'm sorry, my turn again. Okay, this is a few times. Um, where are we? So we have our gift battle API. Um, so we're down here now, right? So create is all done. Let's go into battle. And I missed an H tag, H1 dot title dot is two. Uh, and, and the and trick you can do is you can do a, like the curly brackets and write your text. So we can do battle, fight. That's embarrassing. Um, okay, so we're gonna have two columns. So we're gonna have columns, and then inside of this, we're gonna have a column and its half times two. So we're gonna have two of these, and then left, right, and we'll have them fight. Okay. So gift one, gift two, let's go ahead and make sure we can get that data. So we're gonna have data, here's a function, return an object. Um, and we're gonna have gifts, is null. That's it, yep. Methods. Is an object, and then we're going to say get battle gifts. Um, that's why the shortcuts are so different. Oh, we already have Axios. Cool. So we can have Axios. We're going to say const data is equal to await Axios dot get. Process .env .view app API. And if you're wondering why I made it so long, view app and view underscore app is required by the VCLI um, to do environment variables. If it doesn't have that, view won't even bother with it. Um, what is it called? Versus? Mm -hmm. Versus. Um, and then we say this.gifts is equal to data. And now that we have that, and check this out, I'm going to do it. Correctly this time, uncreated this dot get battle gifts. Cool. So on creation, get the get the gifts, uh, set it in our component, and then finally we're going to show it here. And we want to make sure we only show them. We only want to show them if gifts exist, because and the reason I'm doing it that way is because if we had gift dot URL down here, uh, when this component first gets mounted, GIFs would be null, but it would still try to render everything and it would get down to GIF.URL and say URL doesn't exist on undefined. So, uh, we're going to do this for GIF1 and GIF2, but we have GIFs and we're programmers, let's be lazy, let's uh, do a loop over both of those. So, we're going to do V4, and that's GIF and GIFs, and the way that uh, Vue and a lot of the other frameworks are doing this as performant as possible is you have to add a key to it. So we're going to say vbind colon key is equal to GIF dot ID, anything that's unique, so that Vue knows if I have to update one of these, I can find it in the list very quickly. Um, and then we'll just go <coughs> that. So column is half, and then inside of this, we're going to have a box, and then inside of that, we're going to have GIF container, inside of that, an image, plus a caption, and then plus a.button.isWarning.isLarge. We still have um, VS Code's alt to get them to happen. Maybe we can stop. 
So we want source to gift.url with container caption is going to be gift.caption because we already have it coming back from the API. And then here, um, at click is equal to vote on gift. And then to vote on it, we're going to vote on a specific gift ID. So we actually need to pass in the gift.id here. Vote on this. And hopefully, we're, this all works. Oh, we didn't put in a vote yet. But. OK. Cool. Hmm. As far as decoding GIF 1, GIF 2 into an array. What's that? I, I thought the response was GIF 1, GIF 2. Yeah. And you did it as an array iteration? Um, you mean the if in part? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, view can can handle. Both. Okay, that, that's view that's figuring it out? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, in React, you'd have to do object.keys. So we need to create vote on GIF is the last part of this. So under methods, async votes on GIF, and we're going to pass in an ID in there. I don't think we need the response in a variable, access.post. Vote, uh, and then we're going to pass in the ID. And that's it. So that'll be enough to vote on on a GIF, and then after we vote, we probably want to get a new battle, so we'll just say this dot get battle gifts again, and that'll do that. Any questions on either of these two? Cool. You would do. Oh. You're saying you would have to do this? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's interesting because view, View's uh, actually pretty good at like knowing when you want to do it. So, if we did vote on GIF, like in React, so the question is in React, if we did it this way, vote on GIF, and had the parens in there, it would automatically call it on mount. Um, so let's double check. So if we do vote on GIF, let's just console log. No. So we'll save that. Refresh. Um, so view notes. But in React, for it to not fire, you would have to create it as a function that calls whatever you want. Um, just small nuances. A cool thing that note what view can do is, um, like, let's say you want to prevent default on something. So usually you would do like e dot prevent default. You could just do like prevent dot prevent, and view would know. Uh, and view has like a bunch of other little ones that they can do as well. So I think that's it for this one. No, we don't have to see if it works. It'll just clean it up. So if we go down here, awesome. Oh, we don't have the leaderboard. So awesome is at zero votes. If we come over here and vote on awesome, that was quick. It's kind of scary. Let's vote on this guy. Test 200. Got a new one. Refresh over here, one for that and one for awesome. So it works. Cool. Awesome. Awesome is awesome. <laughs> um, and then for our last endpoint that we had was actually the leaderboard here. Justin, how are we on time? Uh, use your graph up around eight, so a little bit. Oh, okay. I was going to say, um, 
you guys want, since the leaderboard doesn't have any new functionality for, for either view or express, we could just get to the last part, adding authentication to it, and showing how auth works in the context of a view application, and we'll just skip the leaderboard. I'll leave that thing. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. So then we can eat it, because uh, food is there as well. <laughs> so, we, uh, we have this uh, single page application, and let's go to the right one. So within our application, we have the ability now to create a GIF and to battle GIFs, and then if you go to the Netlify version, you can actually see the leaderboard as well. And what we thought we would do is uh, require a user to be authenticated before they can create GIFs, right? Because we don't want just anybody out there uh, creating GIFs and putting all sorts of captions, because that way we can't control them, we can't ban them if they're uh, submitting the, the not safe for work GIFs. So, what we're going to do is we're going to require users to be authenticated, to be logged in before they can uh, create GIFs, but anybody can vote on GIFs because we just want to leave it uh, leave it open to the internet. So if we look at our, uh, and we're going to do this two ways, right? So we're going to protect our API on the web task on the back end side because right now if we were to just protect our view application and say, hey, uh, you know, be like the VF and if you're not logged in, you can't click the create button, a user could still hit the endpoint directly, find out what the, what the URL is, and then keep submitting us GIFs, and we don't want that. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna protect our backend. And the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna do it with uh, JSON Web Token uh, authentication. And how many of you guys have worked with uh, JWTs before? Okay, so a fair number of you. And uh, so I work for a company called Auth0 where we kind of specialize in token-based authentication. So to make this process quicker, we're just gonna use Auth0 for our login system. But the, the code that we're showing is, Auth0 is built entirely on open standards, and most of the JavaScript, most of the node libraries for working with JSON Web Tokens were written by Auth0 and are open source. So whether you use Auth0 or your own authentication server, the process is exactly the same. We're just gonna use Auth0 to speed things up. And um, the way that we're gonna do that is, we have this, uh, we imported this method called express-jwt, which works specifically with the express framework, and all it does is it checks that an incoming request has an authorization header that has a valid JSON web. And we have this middleware here, it's called JWT check, that basically validates the integrity of the token and ensures that the token that was sent with the request is a token that we signed is a token that we trust. So here we're using uh, JSON, web key, um, JSON web keys, and uh, instead of using, uh, we're using the RSD56 hashing algorithm to sign our key, to sign our token, and with that, we're gonna get a public key from us here that's gonna help us uh, validate the integrity of the token itself. If we were using HS256, we would just have a, uh, instead of this secret section here, we would just have a secret string, right? And hey, this is my password, or you know, this is my secret. But we're gonna do it a little bit more secure using uh, RSP56 and public-private key encryption. And uh, so we have this JWT check middleware. To enable it, all we have to do is um, add it in our middleware chain. So I'll just show you how it works in this random endpoint. So right now, we can, um, we can hit the random endpoint and it's not protected whatsoever. So if we go and try to hit random, we're gonna get a gift every single time. And we're gonna get a new gift, but we're gonna get a gift. <laughs> if we add the JWT check middleware now, what's gonna happen when we make a request to this random endpoint is the first thing the web task is gonna do is it's gonna run the JWT check and say, hey, does this request have a token? If it does, it's gonna say, okay, is this token valid? And if, and if it is, then it's gonna serve a gift. If any of those checks fail, though, if the token's expired, if there's no token, if we didn't send one, then the request is gonna short circuit and we're gonna get an error back. So let's see if that works on the random endpoint. So I'll hit refresh and I get the unauthorized error saying no authorization token was found and this is expected because I'm not logged in. I don't have a token to send with the request. So that's fine. 
but we want people to be able to see the token or to see the gift. So we're going to take it off of there and we're going to add it here when you actually go ahead and make a request. So we're going to click the check here. So now, if you were to go in here and try to create a new gift, and say you wanted to say you wanted to create a GIF. Now, if we were to try to call this endpoint, um, capturing, try to save it, try to create the GIF. Now we get a 401 unauthorized because we try to create a we try to create a GIF. We didn't have an authorization token, so our request failed, and we got an error back, and the GIF wasn't created. So that works. And if you guys are curious how we got this piece of code, this uh, JWT check middleware. I can show you that very quickly uh, in the management dashboard. So if you guys were building this yourself, you would get those keys from, from your authorization server. But since we're using Auth0 here, for example, we have our API, if battle API, if battle, and our node quick start is basically just getting that public key, telling us that our audience is gonna be gift battle, uh, the issuer is going to be odd zero. It's going to sign the token once the user is logged in, and the hashing algorithm or the cryptographic signature signing algorithm is RSP fifty six. So that is enough to protect our API backend. So that's enough to protect our node application. So now, but now nobody can actually call and create gifts because in the UI we don't have we don't have the logging functionality yet. So Chris, do you want to implement the logging functionality? <laughs> No, he's, he's done a lot of talking, so I'll be, I'll be happy to jump in and uh, do that. <clears throat> so, let's see. Yeah, we'll go back into our application here. And so, we have the auth server, the auth service already kind of pre-written because this would take 10, 15 minutes to do in real time, so we'll skip that. But basically, all we're doing is uh, bringing in the Alt0 JavaScript SDK, and then telling the SDK what application we're authenticating. So we're authenticating a single page application, a view app in this instance. Uh, so here's my Alt0 information, my client ID, where our application lives, the tokens we want to get back, the audience is going to be Git Battle, so that's the API we're protecting, and so on and so forth. And then we just have a couple of different functions, login to log the user in, log out to log the user out, handle authentication. What this method does is, when we click the login button, we're gonna be redirected to a hosted login page that, it, that we're gonna collect the user credentials from, right? So we're not gonna collect any user information within our view application because we don't trust all the, all the code that we just brought in. We brought in Axios, we brought in a couple of different JavaScript libraries, so we don't want to trust, you know, we're not going to validate all of that code and we're not going to trust it for our user info. So we're going to redirect to a domain for an authorization server, log our user in, and once they're authenticated, we're going to call back to our view, to our single page app, to our view application, and say, hey, the user's logged in, here's your token. So that's what this handle authentication method does. It basically says, hey, um, do, do I have an access token? Do I have an ID token? If I do, great, let's, let's store it in memory so that we can all our APIs. And uh, so that's, and then finally we have our set session. So if the if that handle authentication sees in the URL that you do have a token, it's gonna set the user session, it's gonna set the access token in the application. And then also we have this check session as well. 
And um, the reason that we have this check session method is for a long time, if you were working with uh, JSON Web Tokens, if you were working with token based authentication uh, for single page apps, and whether it was Vue or Angular or React, the, the common best practice was to store your tokens, to store your JSON Web Token in local storage or in session storage or you know somewhere in your application where you can easily get it back uh, without having to basically re-authenticate the user. And that gave you a better user experience because you could refresh the page, you could open up in a new tab and the user would still be logged in because that access token was in local storage. But that's not a secure way to do it because if your app does become susceptible to a cross-site scripting attack or a malicious actor, you know, finds it, or you know, you have an infected library that can execute arbitrary JavaScript. An attacker could easily go into your local storage, steal that token, send it to themselves, and JSON Web Tokens, until they expire in the token, they're valid. So if somebody were to steal the token, they can impersonate your user for a little while, causing all kinds of nasty things. So what we're going to do is, when the user logs in, we're going to get the JSON Web Token, and we're going to store it in memory in our view app. So it's going to be confined to the view application, and when the user leaves, when they refresh the page or open it up in a new tab, we're going to, that token is no longer going to exist, right? So by default, the user would be logged out, and they'd have to log back in again, and that would be a really crappy user experience where if every time you refresh the page, you have to log in again, and nobody would use that app. So this check session method is going to go to our optimization server and say, hey, did this user log in a few minutes ago or 10 minutes ago? Do they still have an active session on the auth server? And if they do, the auth server is going to say, yeah, they have a cookie, they're already locked in, here's who they are, and it's going to issue a new JSON web token and send it back to the new application. So that's what the check session does, and that's why we're using it. So, so let's go into our here, and we'll go into our app. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to Every time we refresh the page, we're going to run a little bit of code. So we're going to say, when our application is created, um, we're going to run that handle authentication method because we don't have routing in this single page app. So if we had routing, we would normally have a callback route that would, that would run this function. But since it's a very minimal function, we're just going to run it every single time the page refreshes. And it's only going to do its thing if a token is valid in the, in the URL. We'll say handle authentication. And then we'll also run the check session every time we refresh the page. Because if the user is logged in, they're going to want to be able to, uh, to log in and um, continue using the app. And then I will also have to uh, bring in my auth server. So I have it brought in, but to use it within my uh, new application, I'm going to have to add the mix in. And all that looks like. So now we can use our authentication server, all of those methods, log in, log out, in, in our view application. So let's go into our header and actually implement this functionality. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to say I'm not as fancy as Chris when it comes to uh, Kevin commands, but we're going to create a menu and we're going to say uh, make our page. We'll say login. So by default, the user is not going to be logged in. They're not going to have an identity. So we're going to ask them to log in. service so that we can use it. So this is much like uh, if you're working with Angular 2, you're bringing in services and you want to be able to use them in different components. And we're also going to add this prop that says if the user is logged in, and we'll get to what that means in a little bit. And then finally, the return is logged in, and by default,
And since we have this odd service, now we can actually call the login method here. So I can just do at click and do login. And I don't have to re-implement it within this application itself, within this component itself, because it already exists in the auth service and we brought it in as a mix. So let me also um, add a VF. So we only want to show the login button if the user is logged in. So if logged in is true, or if the user is not logged in, show the login button. And then let's just copy. say if the user is logged in, we're going to show a logout button, and the function we're going to run is logout. So this should get us the ability to log a user in, log them out, and also handle that authentication that, that comes back from the authorization server if, a, if an authentication is successful. And the final thing we need to do our app component. So in our header, you saw that we added this prop property. And basically what this is, is, what this does is it allows us to get data from different view components. So this is logged in. We're going to pass in from our main app root folder. So here in the header, we're going to say uh, is logged in. Now let's go see if, uh, if any of this made sense and if it actually works. So we go to localhost 8080, and <laughs> I'm actually uh, so since I'm running that check session function, I, you know when we were preparing for the demo, I was already logged in, so it automatically logs me in, and you see the logout button. But here, let me click logout, and now when we run that check session function. It's going to go through the authorization server to Auth0, and it's going to say, hey, is the user logged in? I am no longer logged in, so I'm going to get this error saying that a login is required. So I could handle this a number of different ways. I could have the user you know, show the login form again uh, to have the user logged in, or I could just say, you know, log in yourself. So now I'm going to click the login button. It's going to redirect me to the authorization server, and I'm going to log in. Password. And again, this works great. So our header correctly shows the login and logout buttons, but we still can't. So now we are logged in on the front end, but <laughs> but we still can't create gifts. I can create. I can click the create a gift button, and I should be getting. Sorry, where's the JWT now stored? It's no longer in the local. It's, it's not in the local. So we literally just store it in uh, right here in the auth service. We have a uh, basically the view data store. We're storing the access token and the ID token, and then we can access it throughout the view application. So it's confined to the view application, and every time we refresh the page, it gets destroyed and we get a new one. But that will still be on the browser. It, it, it is in the browser, but if, if an attacker were to, it, it makes it much more difficult for an attacker to retrieve it this way than it is just storing it in local storage and having it persist for a while. So, so it's still not like 100% secure to do it this way, but this is the, the recommended way of storing tokens in memory as opposed to storing them in, in local storage or session storage or you know somewhere more permanent. So if I shut down my browser and pull up the app again, I have to log out. Yes. Oh. Well, we have the so we have the authorization server that has a cookie that they use a traditional uh, cookie-based authentication. So that check session, what it does is it goes, it creates an iframe in the view application, goes to the authorization server and says, "Hey, is this user still logged in? If they are, if they have a valid active session cookie." Then we issue a new token and send it back to the view application so you don't have to log in manually. But if, without that, you would have to log in every time yourself. If you open it up in a new tab or you refresh the page or close the browser and reopen it. So instead of local storage, you're using a cookie just to put the identifier yep. ID. Yep. And, then yep. and we're doing that on a protected.
connected domain away from the, the single page application. Yeah. Um, and then I found out what was wrong. So um, what we actually did uh, in our auth service, we are not in the auth service. So you guys can actually see, um, we did this with the with the Axios library. We we added an interceptor into it that if you if we do have a valid JSON web token, it's automatically added. So you can see this authorization header as soon as I'm logged in and I go to create a GIF, this authorization header gets added with the correct JSON web token, and our backend verifies it, makes sure it makes sure that it runs correctly, and if it does, then it allows us to create that GIF. And actually, let me find where. where did that. Oh, right here. So when we when we run that right. set session method, uh, if we do get a correct access token in an ID token, we actually update the, the Axios library, update its defaults to include this authorization header. So if we were to remove this, this, even though I am logged in, let's refresh the page, even though I am logged in, I would not be able to save this GIF. So I'll hit network, and I'll just try to create a GIF. I would get a 401. So I am logged in on the single page application side, I'm logged in on the view side, but when I go and talk to my serverless application, my node backend, my PHP backend, it doesn't know that I'm logged in, it doesn't know who I am, so it short circuits the request and says, hey, you're unauthorized. But if we have that token and we send it along with the request, then it works great and we can create the token, we can uh, create the GIF, and then vote and do all of that good stuff. So I think that's gonna be basically it for our application. I know we, we had uh, a lot of stuff to go through today and kind of rushed through some of it, and I, I hope it was uh, valuable to you guys, and I hope you guys come up and ask us any questions. We'll be, we'll be around for a little while. Pizza. 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 Thank you guys. Uh, we're always looking for more topics like this, or even you know just a basic topic for more beginner-oriented uh, new frameworks, old frameworks, new ideas, old ideas. So please let us know. Uh, and most of the meetup pages, there should be a link to a, a Google form that makes it easy for us to keep track of all the submissions. Uh, otherwise, uh, thanks for coming. Thank you.